Podcast family, the episode that you are about to watch was recorded over a month ago, and it's crazy to me to see how quickly things have changed in just a short month. Everything that we thought was a priority instantly got replaced by the things that actually matter, our families, our friends, our teams, our customers, our neighbors, and our community, and I'm inspired by that. I know that we're in a very trying time right now, but I am just inspired by everybody coming together. That is exactly why this podcast was created, was to pull this community together. And if there's anything that we can do for you guys during this coronavirus crisis, um, please reach out to me directly um, or via our website or how. just reach out to us. Let us know how we can help you get through this time. That is why we are here. Um, you guys, Things are gonna be okay. We're going to re-strategize. We're going to shift all goals. It's amazing. All the goals that I laid out in January instantly disappeared. They went out the window. I'm creating new goals for this year just based on everything that's happened even in the last few days here. So um, I just wanted to offer you guys a word of encouragement. Just let you know that we've got this. We will adapt. We will re-strategize and we will get through this together as a community. And if there's anything that we can do here at the WHOA GNV podcast team to help you out, please reach out. We'd be happy to do so. Much love to all of you guys. See you later. You are listening to WHOA Podcast. Coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Hey, we hear more Mike's questions. Let's, yeah, let's transition right? a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. He makes it fun. <laughs> throw a big meaty bone out there. All right, no. So, yeah, Come on, Mike. Throw it. So bring it. we talked it. about how the realtors themselves differentiate, stand out. Um, whenever we talked about disruption, whenever something new like... Um, technology comes mm. out like let's talk about like zillow like mm. it, is that a threat to to your everyday realtor <laughs> craig just yeah. did he's like, doing a 360 in his seat because you know at, at one point it's just like okay is this such a platform to to list and then now it's like they're starting to get into a different and, I, and i'm not an expert on this but they're starting to get into a different area it seems so i kind of wanted to talk about that and, and just kind of so, open it yeah like is it a threat zillow to the amazon so, right. open door who are we talking about yeah and so, I mean, like, hey, happen, so right? amazon yeah. is a threat to retail right yeah, so sure. is zillow a threat to real estate From like my what, perspective how are you guys so per- my aunt was a successful broker in kentucky and she got into the business with it when interest rates were like 30 percent or whatever and the other people in the office were jumping out the window and she told me she's like i didn't know anything but <laughs> selling homes with 30 percent interest rates so i just went out and did it <laughs> I came into the business and Zillow and Realtor and Trulia and all of that, Redfin and everything else was already there. I don't know any different. I don't view it as a threat. Do I like paying for leads from them? Not really, but I'll be honest, a lot of my buyers that I work with, when I wanna show them a house that I think they might like, I'm texting them a link to the Zillow or Realtor.com app because I know they have it on their phone and they're comfortable with that. And I'm like, hey, what do you think about this? I, I use it as a tool. That's how I looked for a house when I was buying a house. I'll admit it. I just threw up in my mouth. <laughs> oh. See, and I'm not a Zillow hater or any of these things because I utilize it for my business just like Andy does. And I've been in for, you know, 14 years. I can't count 15 years. And when it came in, I jumped on and I continued on. I was actually the first realtor, you can probably ask Lisa over at Gacar, to say, no, no, I want to stay on Zillow. And I was at Thomas Group. You know, and I forced Thomas Group to get back on. I do and throw up in my that. mouth when somebody says Zestimate, but yes, but you I, can always fight that. Yeah. I, you yes. can always yes. fight that. But but I can I still use the tool. It's just very easy. They're using it. What your buyers are using right. it, whether you well, are or not. Buyers, and your sellers, you're gonna you have to be a part of the bigger picture so you don't lose yourself in in anything. You Maybe have you have to find yourself in and what people are using. And so that the, you, they can find you. The industry will adapt to it, and those who don't will f- find their way out. I was going to say that. You have two options. Mm-hmm. Option one is put your head in the sand and act like it's not going to happen. Swim. And option two is be aware of what's happening around you and don't be afraid to change. Okay, so yeah. but what specifically is happening? Like, what is Zillow doing 
well, for our the real market, estate agency. Well, our market specifically, if we're staying specific to Gainesville, our market specifically has not had the disruptors hit it yet. Yeah. We yeah. have. They're as close as Tampa. We but have. That's still far away. We've got the. the yep. Z- we've got Two Zillow. That that, that, yeah. So the disruptors are the eight, these agencies that are basically web based that are that are listing properties. Um, actually buying properties from owners, um, buyers. going yeah. going through sure. the whole thing, I buyer where they don't come in, allowing um, they they list it and allow access to the properties. Um, basically, all these different things that a lot of realtors believe like I'm the key to your entrance, and there's these disruptors that are allowing this to be a different situation. Um, but I think that as long as you stay educated as to what's going on and know our value, mm-hmm. that's where you're not you're not scared running. You're facing it. So I mean, a lot on. of these companies are actually attracting investors, which do affect yeah. a lot of us, mm-hmm. right? Commercial, you know, in, investor realtors who work with investors to buy lots of properties. You work with one investor, you're going to have, you know, 50 properties that you buy and sell with them, Absolutely. whether it's commercial or residential. So that's a huge business. But in, in Gainesville, we do have a lot of investors, but we're still very much relationship based. Mm-hmm. So that buyer or even that seller who's going online, they're still wanting to reach out to a realtor, a human, a person, someone you can touch, feel, breathe, you know, that person who has a pulse. They still want that. These disruptors are taking that pulse away. So it's really only affecting affecting right now the bigger cities, if we're talking about that kind of disruptor, because there's a couple other disruptors mm-hmm. that are out there. People, uh, you know, this the, there's there are disruptions, which Holly touched on. They're teaching buyers to ask for the commission back, or they are teaching to really fight for their own commission. Or, you know, there's a lot of companies coming in and saying, I'll list your house for, mm-hmm. 1%. Not even 1%. Yeah. A flat you know, fee. A flat yeah. fee of $500. So d- flat fees are disruptors. What are well. they doing? So then you, like you said, you have to show your value. I'm not just putting it on this website that might feed out to a couple of others. I'm actually working it on a personal, personalized, touch feel relationship level. So you're always having to re negotiate with yourself your own value mm-hmm. to work with these. these you know, work within these disruptors. Luckily, we are insulated. We've always been insulated. When the market was tanking, back when we all started, Mm -hmm. we were insulated from that. We didn't tank. Our bottom was 2011, when everybody else's bottom was like 2008. So we bottomed out way later than everyone else. So we already saw how they dealt with that. So we were able to deal with the bottom because we watched everyone else. We learned from them so that when we came back up, we were able to come back up knowing how to deal with that, how to work through that. So right now the disruptors are coming in, the bigger cities, mm-hmm. de- you know, and we're learning how to deal with them through, when you travel, right, and in the real estate world, you learn what these other companies, these other agencies are doing, these other, these other realtors are, are doing so that we have the answers before it even gets here. So you said you threw up in your mouth a little bit when Andy said he, he works with Zillow or uses it. Is, what, do you, do you adapt to it also, or you just have a distaste for it? or Either adapt or die. So what Zillow did was, and, and I say this with reservations, what Zillow did was they satisfied a need in the marketplace, and they did better than realtors did because they, they provided nationwide data in a way that no one else had. And so... Ultimately, what realtors and real estate companies have to do is provide information to the customer in a way that is simple and attractive and easy to get. And so the customer doesn't understand relationships between multiple MLSs. There are MLS boards all over the the state. And the trend now in in the nation is for MLSs to consolidate. So MLSs, like the Gainesville MLS is one entity. There are MLSs in the state of Florida, there are 35 or 40 MLSs. And the prediction in the future is that there might be four or five in the next five years. So MLSs are consolidating. And multiple listing services are individual companies that are siloed. So the Gainesville market was siloed from everybody else. If you're a member of the Gainesville MLS, you're not a member of other MLSs. So it's a lot of, there's a lot of complexities to it. What's happening more and more is that the customer is getting information from a third party that it should be getting from us, but we're not doing a good enough job to give it to them. So they're going to third party national companies. So MLSs are starting to combine and to provide better service to the customers. 
The reason I throw up my mouth is because the information that is on national websites like the Z Word, for example, may not be as accurate as it would be from you get from a realtor because it's not timely. It doesn't update nearly often enough. It doesn't update in a way that, that matters. The reason I'm not threatened by the existence of companies like Zillow is because I know that my information is current and relevant and more real to me. And so my customer is getting real information from MLS, which is definitely 100% accurate because realtors have to put it in. There are, there are standards related to the MLS system that don't apply to third parties like Zillow. We have standards, we have a code of ethics, we have things that matter that, that actually are real time. And so when we put information in about what's happening with a particular property, you can go to a realtor and get accurate information within minutes, whereas it may take more time for the national platforms to update. And a lot of times those, those national platforms don't update fast enough to be relevant. So real people in the world, the consumer doesn't know that because the consumer is looking at a really pretty website with a fancy interface. They don't see that that information may be old. There have been stories where people have gone and knocked on doors, hey, here your house is for sale. And the person that answered the door said, no, I just bought this house two months ago. So the information is old because there's not a standard practice where that information would be updated. And we, as realtors, update that information on a regular basis. So the reason I throw it in my mouth is that it's not accurate information that's relevant to right now. I, just concerned I think the truth is, though, it's getting better, and it will only continue to get better as they syndicate well, out so faster. So Zillow but it's forcing has more us money to get better, which than is why MLS National is Association of Realtors. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not disagree <coughs> with him, but I'm going to add to this, because I'm not actually the same supporter of the association as Dave. Everyone knows this in Gainesville. Um, but I... So the Zestimate, which you threw up in your mouth, Zillow, they <laughs> find, they get in he he said, yes. the they get yeah. information <laughs> everywhere. So you as the realtor, they come to you and say, oh, this is a pre-foreclosure, or this is information I receive. You should be able to know how to combat that and look that up and show how actually it's not accurate information. I'm glad you came to me as a realtor mm -hmm. so I can give you that accurate inf information. So that's not actually a pre-foreclosure. That's someone who did not pay their loan on time, they were served a list of pendants. You're getting this from the public records. Let me tell you, let me let me explain this to you and then let me find you something better. The right? truth. So you're finding, they're finding you because you are, unfortunately, you're, you're <coughs> they're selling you your own listings. This is why the association doesn't like it, doesn't like companies like Zillow, because you're only getting on part of what's wrong with disruptors, right? So they don't like Zillow because they're selling back the information that we're putting out there. And well, I didn't say I didn't like Zillow. I said I didn't like buying, inaccurate information. We're buying like that information. information from them even though we're providing it to them. So we have to buy it back to sell it back to the to buyers and sellers. Back in the day, we didn't have to do that. Now we have to do that. We have to buy it, sell it back to produce the leads, so they're expensive leads. But if they come to you, you're able to explain why it's incorrect or not exactly accurate information so you can give that to them so then they can trust you. Oh wait, that is wrong. I've been calling everybody and these other realtors are telling me that oh, no, that's not true and they're hanging up. But you're actually educating me on why it's wrong and why I need to go directly to you rather than online. Look, the, the internet's not a fad, so we're gonna have to get mm -hmm. used to that. It's making the dissemination of information a lot easier and free and accessible to people. We're gonna adapt to that. But the thing about real estate is it is hyper-local. And Gainesville's very uh, peculiar in this Insulated. sense because when you buy leads as a realtor, if I wanna get leads from Zillow or Realtor.com, I pay by the zip code. Well, in the same zip code in Gainesville, you will have, let's do, Hale Plantation, great neighborhood. A house in Founders Hill and a house in India Station are not worth the same per square foot. You can have in the same zip code a very uh, low-value neighborhood and 500 feet away, you have some of the nicest, most expensive homes in town. And Zillow's algorithm and the algorithm, algorithms that those tech companies use to give you that estimated value don't know that. Your local agent knows the market and can give you, because I think the biggest question that we answer a lot of times for buyers and sellers is, what is this property worth? That's what people wanna know, what is it worth? What is a fair price for this property? And the only way to really determine that is on similar sales when you're talking residential. What have like properties actually sold for? What are people willing and able to pay? And so that's something that we still offer that value that the technology has not caught up to yet. So what you did is you just asked like the question of the of the whole night. That's like the question. Yeah, that's like the question. Yeah, Mike is the man. Wait, he, he was so quiet so and then all of a sudden I'm just boom, taking it yeah, all in. You boom. Know? I mean, it's just okay, Hits so it. I mean like the 
you know, we can talk about this all yeah, night all long. There's no question. I'm like for all week, all week. Two. You know, we're gonna get hour five. Here's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we got plenty of booze. We got plenty yeah, of wine. Yeah, yeah. we can be here till like Let's ten o'clock go. at night. I'm, good. I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in tonight, so we're good. <laughs> this is also episode one hundred and one. They're gonna erase. They're gonna erase the first two hours and then post this. There you go. So the the answer to your question is that you know disruptors and this and that and everything else. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that real estate ain't about the real estate agent. Yeah. All right, it's about the customer. So what's happening now is back in the day, it used to be it was all about the agent because you know it was like we had all the data, we had all the information, the information. we had all the access, That's and so changed. you know back when I got into real estate, there wasn't there was no web there was no real estate websites back in two thousand two. There were no real estate websites. I mean, no like com- brokerage companies didn't really have websites, and you didn't go. There was no Zillow. There was no Facebook. There was no anything. It was just, you know, if you wanted to find out about a house, you had to, you know, we had the MLS, you know, so we knew what was for sale. But if you wanted to buy a house and know what's for sale, you had to call an agent and then find out what was, what's out there, unless you drove by and saw a sign, and we provided you with the information of what's for sale. You came into the office, you sat down, we looked at all the com, all the, all the houses up, you know, but now with the invention of just online portals and what we call syndication, which we you know we give, the MLS is giving information out to brokers and companies like Zillow. Third party. What happens is the customer now is empowered to have all the information in the fingertips. Well, this is not unique to real estate. This is everything, okay? And so what happens is the, the expectation of a consumer is that they have the ability to go in. If I wanna know, if I wanna look up somebody, a famous person, I go to Wikipedia, I can go look up you know, things on Amazon, I can Google everything. Can go on Facebook so information is, it is, it is <laughs> an expectation person. of the consumer that if I wanna nice. know something, I can know it without having to call anybody. So we have to, as in, the, in our real estate industry, a lot of people in our industry are trying to hold on to this concept that we are needed for information. We are no longer needed but for information. But there's a no. lot of newbies also. Well, what we are needed are for, not used to we're, that. we're needed for context. Okay, so like if I have a medical condition and I, something's wrong with me, I don't know what it is. I can go online and go to WebMD and everything else and try to understand, but I gotta go, eventually, if I'm really sick, I have to go find a medical professional that understands medicine, that can evaluate my specific need for my situation and then give me consultation on what I can do to, to, be, to, be, to live, right? So what happens in our industry is people are gonna we have to, the information, it's too late. We can't, we can't bring the, the horses back into the stable. The horses are <laughs> running free, okay? All the information is out there now. So what, we're, what we have to do now is say, okay, what can we do? You know, Zillow and these companies, they're, they're disruptors, but what can we do to put out product for the consumer that's better? That's right. Than what Zillow's doing, than what Realtor.com and everybody else, what they're doing. Can we create product for the consumer that is better, more valuable, for them than what they can do. And if we do that, then we will have the eyes and ears. People will not have the Zillow app on their phones anymore. They're gonna have our app on their phones because our app will be better than Zillow app. Well, and also our app will customize a response to their particular situations. That goes back to authenticity. Correct. And relationship. Yep. That's right. And that it's a human business. so, So it could either be you pay for leads from where Zillow, whatever, Realtor.com, whatever you're talking about, Amazon, whatever, or you can be the relationship. So they wanna go to you, regardless of that app on your phone, which is what you just said. Mm -hmm. They wanna come back to you because again, you are the lifeblood, you are the human, you are the living, breathing organism that's going to bring them the real information. We can all look online real quick and find what we want. You know, oh, this is the disease I have, this is the house I have, you know, or I want, this is the shirt I want, whatever. But you want to go to that person. I can buy a shirt online, but when I'm looking, you know, when people are looking at houses, not the investors, but when they're looking at homes, they want a human to talk to. Because we're still human, we're crazy humans, but we're still humans. So, something that's changed in the day to day. At least you admit that you're one crazy. More second. I mean, that that Zillow lead or whatever's coming to you that you're paying for, that's the icing on the cake. The yeah. relationship is what matters. But, the icing on cake to make the extra money that you need the extra other support for are those leads that you're buying. Everything else is the the truth is that relationship with that person. Yeah, and one of the things that's changed day to day back, you know, the older, more traditional way is you sit down with the buyer and say, what are you looking for? What are your non-negotiables? What would you love to have? All right, I'm gonna take all those parameters. I'm gonna go check everything in the MLS. I'm gonna show it all to you. Which of these do you wanna go see? 
and and you control the information and maybe they told you all these non-negotiables and they didn't like any of the houses you sent and then you get a text what about this house that violated like three of them and you're like well I never would have showed that to you because there's three things on your checklist that you had to have that this house doesn't fit but they saw the picture they love it so buyers are literally texting and emailing listings from Zillow and Realtor and these other apps saying I want to go see these houses they're taking control of that side of the process in some situations. That's how I was when I bought a house before I had my license. I was sending my agent, I was like, I wanna go see these. I don't need you to come up with, I already saw the pictures, I've pre-shopped, these are the ones I'm interested in. I love it because I get a more qualified buyer that I, know, I already I know before they that, walk in the man. door. Well, I think as an I, agent, it's become if easier value, in a way. You feel your right? values in any way and the, as an information holder of like what's available, school, right? you've lost, you've <laughs> like totally <laughs> lost your value because yeah. I mean, I. I I don't. I don't sit down with Craig and go, Craig. Tonight, I think you want a sandwich for dinner. <laughs> and Craig's like, No. He absolutely want wants a sandwich for dinner. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> Whatever you got. Ham and turkey and Swiss yeah. cheese. I can tell. So that's. I mean, that's like the holder of information. Like, what are we? I mean, like, like that's not our job. Like, I, and I honestly, you know, I've been in the business when when Zillow was kind of coming at at us and, and it's gotten stronger and stronger and stronger, but never in this time that I've been in here have I thought, that's my job is the holder of information. So I, I, I think that as long as we're willing to realize that we are the analyst of that information. Sure, I like that word. We are the human factor of the transaction, the person who understands the steps it's going to take you to get that house or that sandwich that you picked, those are that's the thing. That's that's what we are. We help you through each and every step and we navigate the human part of it. You gotta find yeah. out what kind of sandwich he wants. He might want a sandwich, but we don't know what kind of sandwich or maybe it's a what sub kind? that he wants. Right. And he'll tell you he's vegan, then he'll get a roast beef sandwich. Yes, it's right. exactly he doesn't right. like mayo, but <laughs> So I mean, I, I'll tell you, on when, when, when I sit down with a buyer, the first thing we do when we have a consultation as a buyer is I tell you, I will most likely not find you the house you're wanting. You will likely send it to me because I'm going, Thank you. I, yes. I, I'm like, I'll, I'll set you up with the information or a cart with your parameters and I'll get you all that automated sending stuff. But I know you're sitting there daily because this is your biggest thing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sitting there daily thinking about your biggest thing of what house you're gonna so want. So you're setting expectations. <laughs> oh, wait, so you, you systems. Yes. And you tell them, use what, oh, here, use what's my app, happening? or yeah. use whatever is easiest for you. But if they're gonna connect with you and show and, and yeah. see your value, whatever they use, they're still gonna come back to you. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter if they're using Zillow or if they're using Rebel, but they're using Papine's, you know, Website, website or like I, I don't mean, care what they use because I know they're going to come back to me because they've seen my value and if they didn't come back to me move it I, I've had buyers send me a link to another broker's website and this is the house I want to go see and I'm like I use that website too cool. yeah it's well, I like it Whatever interface you like. I have a question. Come on, baby. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I'm like raising my hand at my own podcast. Colin, Hello. You got six wrestling agents that love this podcast. All right, you, Michael, Michael and like, I down here. Again. This Bye. is our show. Bye. We get to like ask the questions. <laughs> Don't have a conversation <laughs> without us. <laughs> so, I'm entering a new phase of my entrepreneurial career. Sixteen years in business. I want to start investing Me into too. real estate, baby. <laughs> Me too. No, that was two swirls right there. Right? <laughs> so, so I'll tell you, it's pretty interesting because, you know, one of the things that I've realized about the most successful entrepreneurs in the world is that oh, they all estate. have real estate oh, in that. their portfolio. And not just in the town they live. Can I right? rant quickly? Can you rant quickly? Yes, on this topic. No, this is 100% my Colin show. show. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. What, what, what you got? What you got? So, Andy, throw it. Throw in it. In my throw it. humble opinion, real estate is the greatest investment in the world in the fact that what other asset can you buy with somebody else's money and have somebody else pay for and reap all the benefits? <laughs> You, you buy it with a loan, you have your tenant, whether it's commercial or residential, pay off that loan, and then you get all the equity. 
We all high five twice. Yeah, that's exactly it. Cheers uh, again. And if me, you buy true. Bitcoin at nine thousand and it goes down to four thousand, you just lost five thousand dollars. Yeah. It may yeah. it may never come back, but the real estate market can go up and down. At the end of the day, they ain't making any more land. People need a place to live. They need a place to run their business. You can ride it out in real estate, and you have a physical asset to and back. Right now your is the time. Yeah. Okay, so, so true story. Uh huh. It's it's pretty funny because ns4l. You called us all here just to episode get number <laughs> son. Real Epi- smart, right? episode number one ns4l okay, tv episode number you. one. <laughs> I'm walking through this space mm-hmm. as it's being remodeled. I, in fact, it was before it was remodeled. Thank God you got a haircut too. Right, I got a haircut because yeah. I had really long hair I've been at the time. That for years. <laughs> and and I walked through the property and I said. The owner doesn't know it yet, but I'm gonna buy this property. And I ended up buying this property shortly after that. And it'll probably be one of the greatest investments that I've ever made, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I believe that the most successful entrepreneurs on the planet invest in real estate. So for the audience that's listening, if they're going to invest in real estate, where do they start? Okay, Mm -hmm. because we have so many, I mean, Gainesville's changed so much, and I I wanna dive into Gainesville a little bit before we finalize this episode, but Gainesville has evolved so much. I was an entrepreneur that had to figure out everything on my own. I figured out every single thing on my own. I had no guidance whatsoever, right? And that's changing. Now we have a whole innovation hub, we have incubators, we have people who are so invested into the success of this community, and it is what has driven me to create this podcast with Mike and, and get this thing off the ground. And I'm super, I'm just ex, I'm ecstatic about the future of Gainesville. Right, like it just pumps me up, baby. I think no, that I need like bigger a, muscles. Ga- like, the whole city of Gainesville is like a startup business. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is right. Is. So, where do they start? Depends. But, it depends. There's so many different ways yeah. to invest. You can flip houses. You can do buy and hold rentals. You can do residential, commercial. You can invest. okay, but 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 I mean, I'm a brand new brand new entrepreneur. I'm making I'm making some money. I'm pulling put some profit aside. Where should how I invest? Involved, is it into how involved residential? Is it into commercial? Hands-on. Like, what are the answers? I want to go around the room. Multi-family and syndication. If you just got cash and you don't have time, <laughs> Dave, so, I might have an opinion. <laughs> First of all, yes to real estate. Um, investors need to understand there's something called interest rate risk, right? So we are dealing with interest rates now, especially the, the Fed just cut the rate again because of coronavirus. We're dealing with the lowest interest rates in my lifetime that we've seen. And when you buy a residential investment property, you are locking in a rate for 30 years, maybe 20 years, 25 years. When you buy commercial real estate, and I'm a commercial guy, I love commercial, you are looking at a three or five year balloon, which means when you buy it in three or five years, you gotta renegotiate your loan, and if you don't have 20% equity, you got a problem. So I can tell you that the market tanked, what, 2007, 2008. Are they all three to five? Not all. What, it depends, what's the depends best on how much money that I can get as a real estate? Honestly, it depends on how much money you guy. have. It depends on depends on the buyer, right? But for most banks, banks are worried about leaving money on the table. So if a bank lends you money on commercial real estate at a cheap rate, they know that they want to be able to renegotiate the deal pretty quickly because they're everybody's banking on rates going up at some point. Nothing's going to happen probably between now and the election because you know. Everybody wants everything to stay the same for the election, right? But as interest rates go up, your return diminishes. So when you buy a property, you're gonna have to requalify for that loan in three or five years if it's commercial. Residential real estate, you're gonna buy a property, you're gonna go into it, and you're gonna buy it, and you're gonna sit on it for probably 30 years or less, but you can lock a loan in for 30 years. You have controlled a variable that is interest rate risk. Because if you buy today, the rate is what? What's today's rate, Craig? It's under three. Under three. So if you can buy investment real estate today at under three and know that you have that deal for 30 years, then then as the rates go up over time, you're immune to it. In commercial real estate right now, you're not really immune to it because in three or five years, you're going to renegotiate your balloon. Unless it's an SBA deal. SBA deals typically have a 10-year deal involved, a 10-year loan. So 
My what experience is, is what's SBA stand? small business administration. So the government will help. Dude, gar- you should have a podcast. Yeah. No, the way you like you. Un- I'll unfold just come visit things. You every now and then. There you go, Craig. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Unfolding things for our audience. That's great. Nice. So thanks, Craig. So so small business administration loan has guarantees from the government backing the loan making it better for small business owners to be able to borrow money. They make it easier for small business owners to borrow money. To me, if you want to start and you want to start wisely, you buy a residential investment property because you control the interest rate risk. You take that off the table immediately. Okay. And, and also a lot of people, what a lot of people do that's really smart is they buy an investment property that they know is short term because what they're going to do is they're going to turn around and they're going to buy something else later and they lease out the one they buy. So, you know, if you buy a property and you live in it for two years, you get homestead exemption, right? And if you turn around and sell it within five years, you keep all the capital gain and then you roll it into a larger property. So the smart way for me to get started in real estate is you buy a residential real estate (laughs) property, you live in it for a while, and then when you go to sell it, you keep all the capital gain out of it and reinvest it in something else without interest rate risk at all. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm hugely averse to interest rate risk, right? So if you look at the, the, the biggest investors in Gainesville, Florida, they paid attention and they saw the market turning before it turned. They cashed out at top of the market, they sat on the cash, and when the market adjusted, they got back in. So today, there are a lot of things on the market that are overpriced, and I won't tell you what they are, you can call me if you want to, but <laughs> there are a lot of things that are overpriced that I think you should avoid. So there are certain investors who call me and say, I want to buy now. I'm like, no, you want to save all the cash you can and wait for it to adjust. Mm -hmm. You want to sell now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a time to be a seller and smart investors know when that is. Mm -hmm. But if you're just getting started, start with residential property, build up property management experience so the bank doesn't make you hire a manager down the road if if you don't want one, right? But the smart investors will hire a manager up front so they learn how to do what they're doing. Tenants are smart. They're smarter than owners a lot of times. They will eat your lunch if you don't know what you're doing. So start out with residential, have a property manager teach you for at least a year, build your portfolio, and then sell it and roll it up. I think that, so I didn't say this before, but the, the years that I was licensed in Atlanta, um, so we moved there in 2008, and I, lost, I got my license in 2010 after we had already started um, flipping properties. So that's all we did while we were in Atlanta, and that's when the market failed. and. So we were taking bank, bank roll type stuff that the banks were trying to get rid of and, and flipping them. So just buying them low and, and turn it and renovating and flipping. And I, there's one rule in real estate investment and it's called buy low, sell high. Amen. That's the one rule, that's it. It's super simple. So buy low, sell high. So if you're in a market that is current like ours that would be considered a seller's market, with low interest rates, if you can find a deal that is that is available, it is it is a good time to get a hold of that and turn that property around quickly. I'm unsure on if this market is the market to buy and hold a lot of property. That may be coming in the near future once we see a correction of some sort at some point in time. I think on the buy and hold, if it cash flows, you've got a lot of wiggle room built in. So if you can buy with a really low interest rate, let's say a a home and your monthly mortgage payment and taxes and insurance are gonna be well below what your market rent is. Because let's be honest, when the housing market crashed, rentals did fine. All those people getting foreclosed on, getting thrown out of their house still had to live somewhere. They were renting because they couldn't buy another house. But the rental rates adjust as well. They do. So that, that doesn't like it doesn't mean that something today. That's and Lisa's renting. also talking about flipping versus having yeah. a rental. So, if but I'm saying if you do, if you do decide to hold mm-hmm. something. I don't. Wanna, I don't know. You want to rent it out? Y- yeah. You you obviously are going to rent or it out. There. But buying high and renting out, you are at a risk because the rent the rents will adjust as well. If, they if will. we see a massive market shift, we will see a variance in in those ability to get. The rent on that property. But let's just throw arbitrary numbers out there. Let's say a house is renting for sixteen hundred. Your your total all in PITI is twelve hundred a month, and the mark the rates adjust, and now your rent's only twelve hundred a month. You can get by. You like I said, you've got if you have good cash flow, you have that wiggle room to get by until the market picks up again. But as long as the rate is fixed. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> fixed rate, fixed rate. Again, but yeah, there's always like risk. There's rate. risk in every investment. Yeah, there's risk in real estate investment. There's risk in every investment. But again, I think there's no better vehicle than real estate compared to stocks, bonds, crypto, 
investing in a business, anything like that. And you can invest in real estate notes, you can invest in syndications. If you just wanna be really hands off, you can vet out a big syndication that's investing in multifamily and spreading that risk out over multiple doors and multiple properties. There's so many options. I will be the first to admit that NS4L.TV, episode number one, walking through this property, I say, I'm going to buy this property. At the time I was leasing it, right? I said, I'm going to buy this property. And I ended up buying this property. And I think it'll be one of the single best investments that I've made as an entrepreneur. When I got married, we rented a townhouse together and we lived there for four years before we bought our first home together and paid, I don't know, roughly $50,000 in rent over that four years. Built a house, sold it three years later. Nobody handed me a check for $50,000 when I moved out of that townhouse. Right? Did I net profit after all expenses? No, but I lived in a nice house for three years. I mean, there, there's definitely power to ownership versus renting. And after I saw that, I was like, yeah, I'm never gonna be the one renting again. Like I, I'm own from here on out. Yep. Colin, is this building that you bought, so you know, when you bought it, is it worth more than $250,000? Yes. Okay, are you cost segregating your building? Am I what? Are you cost segregating <laughs> your building? Cost That's a fancy term you gotta pay for normally. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. We'll talk later. Okay. So there's, there's actually a lot of opportunity for you in that area. I just recognized early, one, the biggest thing that I recognized was that I'm like, my business is here. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be worried about the deals that are happening behind my back, yeah. right? Yeah. If, if this is my bit, so I made an offer to the owner and he accepted it and I took, and I, and I got the deal, right? right? Like, and it'll single-handedly be one of the best deals that I've ever made as an entrepreneur, for so sure. The, so the, the investment side of real estate is a huge opportunity for all of us. Um, and I think to your point, Lisa, um, I think now is actually a good time to be a real estate investor. Um, we actually so good that we actually we launched an investment arm in our team, and so um, there are actually believe it or not, there's actually opportunities out there, great ones to get properties for cheap. And I've got a very captive audience here, and so I will add all of you to our mailing list, um, <laughs> so that you guys, if you look, and if you seriously, if you are looking for investment opportunities, they're out there. And so, <laughs> so, hey, I gotta, <laughs> so, hey, hey, my, hey yeah, moment, so real quick, real, like I mean, as an as an investor, syndicate together, right? <laughs> an entrepreneur. So, I've definitely recognized that the greatest entrepreneurs on the face of the planet have real estate in their portfolio. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. No question. So, should it be residential or should it be commercial? I don't think it's not. It's not a should. It should mm-hmm. this or that. It's it's more so of a you know where are you, is your comfort zone? Now, here's the, the bottom line: is this, no matter what you do, whether it be residential or commercial, whatever you have, you need to have somebody there, like a team of people who are going to like counsel you through that process. And so um, if you're looking to buy commercial real estate investments, you better find a, you know, a good financial person, a good commercial real estate agent, a good, you know, have a team of folks there to help you navigate through that process and determine whether or not it's gonna be a good investment for you. Um, residential, same, same difference. You need to have a good residential uh, investment person, somebody that does it themselves, right? You don't wanna find a real estate agent, there's 1,300, 1,400 people here, uh, but many of them do not invest in real estate. So you wanna find someone that's already doing that, that you can get with, who can actually help you understand what you're getting ready to get into because people do, I see people all the time make horrific mistakes in their real estate investing because they don't understand what they're doing and they don't have proper counsel. And so, uh, but there are a lot of great opportunities out there for real estate investments. I bought three like in the past 30 days, okay, because they're good. And so, you know, there, there are, you know, but yes, you should do that, continue to do that. I will connect you with someone that can help you with this building because there's a lot of money in this building you can, you can save in your taxes that a you good, might not be aware of. A good deal is a good deal, whether it's residential or commercial. That's exactly right. It, there's no wrong answer to that question. People yeah. make money and, and do very well in both areas. We have to wrap up soon, which is crazy to think about because it's gone. Uh, we're an hour three. That's the opposite. Dude, we're almost Wrapping up is the opposite, is opposite of woe. I know, but hey, hey, let's listen, 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 listen. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Um, let's talk about Gainesville for a little bit. Okay. 
So, where do you guys, and I want to go around and let everybody speak, where do you think Gainesville's missing its potential? Mm. We'll start with Holly. Craig, <laughs> you always have to have the last yeah. word. You can't start? Come on. You can't. Where, where's start. Gainesville? Where's Gainesville missing its potential? Because you guys know we've mm-hmm. talked about it. Like we're we're doing this podcast for the benefit of building Gainesville. I 100 percent believe that this podcast will absolutely build this community. In fact, episode 101 is a recording with a person who brought their business to Gainesville because of this podcast, which is, I'm not even kidding. They were in Dallas, Dallas, Texas. They brought their business to Gainesville because of this podcast. I, I get so much, you guys, I can't even begin to explain the amount of purpose that I have through this recording and doing sessions exactly like this. Um, so I'm ecstatic about that particular episode. Um, but, you know, where where are we still missing out? Right, Colin, what what do question. we need? What does Gainesville need? What is the, what is the, what more is student the, housing. More student housing, yeah. <laughs> Better shopping. Better shopping. Do we have two more hours? I, know, right? I mean, Golly, dude. we can... This is my po- we can we can do whatever we want. This is our podcast. We what is, what is plenty? What is Gainesville's greatest export? Greatest export? Yeah. What's Gainesville's greatest export? You Talent. educated Brad. people. Talent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we export it. Gainesville's don't, greatest care. export 100%. is talent. Right. Okay. So understand what I'm saying. Export. Export. So are you saying that we need to keep them here? Hello. Yes. yes. We, we got the University exactly of Florida. We got some great, smart, brilliant. Talented people who don't have the glue to Gainesville. <coughs> we breed them here. We and educate them. them. We have incubators and hubs and blah blah right. blah blah. And then these people with great minds and they great ideas, stay, but they can't find they what leave. they correct. But we create that perception, right? Because Gainesville is a college town that you go to to go to school, right? I speak at they UF all the time, and when I'm speaking in these classes, I'm telling them, "Hey, you guys are a top seven talent that we need to keep right here in Gainesville. Yeah, We're not going to keep everybody. I completely understand that mm-hmm. and I don't expect that but if we can keep a larger percentage of that top seven talent right here in Gainesville we're going to benefit the community, so right? There's, there's your opportunity. The biggest opportunity we have to, to make our city a much better place. So when you look at a community, I don't care, I travel a lot, okay? And so I've been in a lot of great cities and popular cities and, and I go to, I'm thinking, you know what? We can do this in Gainesville, mm-hmm. right? For sure. I mean, so like imagine if there was something about our city that created glue to the city that people did not want to leave. What could we do? What if people wanted to build businesses and build companies and build, you know, like, you know, recreation and build, you know, entertainment and and restaurants and food and culture, you know, and they can build that right here because they didn't want to leave. So the opportunity that we have as a community is to say, to get together and say, okay, what, what do we need to do? You know, where, who are the people that are leaving and why are they leaving? Right, so you have a demographic of humans that continually leave our our area because, well, I don't, I can't find the entertainment, I can't find the connections, I can't find this. That's where we where we lack as a community. Mm-hmm. We 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 lack those things that drive people. So when I you look at places like I went to um, uh, in South Carolina, um, Greenville. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, what a great city! Right, so Greenville, South Carolina. I've been I went there for a chamber visit, and. You know, the topography, the, the, the area is very nice. Okay, well, we have nice areas, too. We have beautiful, you know, lakes. We have beautiful springs. We have great, you know, prairies. And, and we, have, we have a lot of trees for Florida. I mean, it's like, you know, how do we maximize that experience around our nature to get people to say, let's create attractions in our city that people like to go to? How do we, in, how do we get businesses and companies and people to invest in the topography of our city to create experiences around the things that already exist in the city. We lose a lot of people, uh, talk to tons of people who are like, you know, younger single people, right? And they go, well, we don't have the nightlife, we don't have the culture, so we're leaving because we can't, because it's a, either, you know, Gainesville is good for college students or like married folks with families, but there's a gap, right? So there's an opportunity. What can we do as a community to create an environment that's welcoming to single people who are not married, 
you know, of course, if you're single, you're not married. So, uh, you know, pe- pe- people who are in, the, in, a, in a time of their life where they want connection with other people, you know, single people here. How can, what, what can we do as a community to provide a, a space for that here in Gainesville? The sad thing is you're saying exactly what we said 20 years ago. Well, that's the problem. That is the sad but part. I have to do. I have to say that Gainesville is working hard. We've got Depot Park. We've got K- mm-hmm. Museum mm-hmm. Sweetwater. Have you been out there? Mm-hmm. It's absolutely gorgeous. So we are on the cusp of changing, and it's because the university is bringing in people who want to stay. And we there's tell innovation. Our story. Yeah, I mean, what's our story? You know, Celebration Point and and Butler's. Uh, they're growing so much. Their shopping was always hard. And they're bringing it in. The more they bring it, and the more they people, our community supports them and doesn't send off people and doesn't push people away. The more that we invite them in and accept them and and bring them joy and bring them the customers and bring them the business <coughs> and support, the more they will stay. Because that's always been the problem. I don't think Gainesville as a whole has always. I always support supported that growth. That's what I was going to say. The we're opposition supporting. of growth is We're always is afraid of, true. I'm gonna, we're going to be the next Orlando or Tampa mm-hmm. or Miami. We're going to be this horrible place. No, you got to think we have to be the next like Austin or the next, you know, not Aspen, but um, Asheville, you know, where we grow mm-hmm. up and closer together with rather than outwards, super far away where we don't right. even see each other. We have to bring in this growth to go up so we're all close to each other so we can enjoy the connections, enjoy the beauty of Gainesville and the beauty of Alachua County. I mean, and that's, from someone that's what's who happening right now was more than ever before. Someone who was born here and has mm-hmm. lived here mm-hmm. pretty much my whole life, face ACR. Um, Gainesville's come a long way. We've grown a lot in my lifetime, but we have a long way to go. In my opinion, I think East Gainesville's kind of been left by the wayside. And I look at places like Ocala, right down the road. We have the interstate that comes through here. That's great. Ocala's building these distribution centers for Chewy.com and AutoZone and Dollar General, employing four, five, six hundred people in one building. Where is that? Where is our industry? Where is our manufacturing? We're, we're doing a great job bringing on tech, and we have Tech City. We have uh, Progress Park out in Alachua so in nearby. But there's other industries we're ignoring, a different set of skills of people that we can employ. Affordable starter homes for people that are between that rental and new home, you know, 300,000 plus price range. There's a real shortage of that, in my opinion, in this in this town. And I think if we were a little more, I'm going to say pro-business to, to mm-hmm. bringing new types of industry into town and creating jobs, not just for the highly educated graduates, but for for a broader range of people and an airport. Mm -hmm. We need an airport because a large company is not going to want to bring a a huge corporate office here that's going to have require people to come in and out with a three terminal airport that goes to three cities in the U.S. Like we have to have the infrastructure to support that if we really want to attract and grow and and kind of pop off the way that some of these other cities have that we want to compare ourselves to. Well, I think that's where it comes into to actually becoming part of what's going on in your community. And there's so many aspects of what is happening here that is distasteful to people because they don't fully understand what is hap- what people want. Um, but there's also people who are blocking it in you know county, city, government officials that don't want the growth, or people look at it and think it's sprawl, and all these different aspects that make. It, it, it get kind of a bad name. Um, you know, the Butler expansion was not the, everyone's most favorite thing coming in, but it has done a pretty amazing job of bringing things that Gainesville never saw before and has, you know, is, is going to help us to continue to get people to want to be here, to want to stay. And I know it's like chain restaurants don't make your life, but they do create a place where people will stop as they're hitting down the highway and go, oh, look, there's that. Oh, what else do they have here? So, I mean, there's just, if we don't, if we sit and we just do what we're doing and you just, like I said earlier, like silos, you just get involved in your thing and you're not aware of what's happening around you and what's happening in your community and you're not aware of who your leaders are and why they're there and and I think Dave probably has a lot to say on this. He's a big guy involved in public policy things. And I've dabbled into it now as I'm mm-hmm. second year of kind of being part of that and seeing what our realtor community wants. And um, I think it's just important to start getting our heads out of the sand and be aware so that we can help drive that change and growth and 
know what it is that's going to be right for this community and how do we help to affect that change? What needs to be done? Yeah. What kind of education needs to be out there to drive these changes for our community? And not to sound crazy, but I'm going to throw uh, lower property taxes, lower utility rates, and better traffic management onto my list, mm-hmm. too. I would love to see all those things. That's real. Talk to the university. Holly, you were absolutely going to say something. She's going to sing it. Holly, please. <laughs> sing it, girl. Sing it. Hey. Yeah. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> please sing us um, something. I actually was going to go Holly. back to um, <laughs> what Craig was saying about our biggest asset being the university. As a student who was here 20 years ago, um, when I was here, I specifically remember thinking to myself, there's nothing outside of Gainesville than this university. Mm-hmm. And that was my experience. So I think if we're talking about r- accessing and our biggest resource being people who are going away, it's going to go back to how are we even touching, what, what's our touch point with the humans, the people that are here at the University of Florida? Because as a student, you only see that, and they you come and you go, and I didn't even know the community that I know now as a parent. Well, it wasn't in my sphere, Perfect. right? So mm-hmm. what's your world, you know? And that, I, I mean, it can go deeper than like trade versus, univer- you know, like, and what you're, I, I mean, it, but if we're accessing, if, if our biggest asset in Gainesville is what you said in terms of the people who are at the university, we're not reaching them. We're not reaching them at all. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't know outside of the university because I was right. there. We don't know that. We're just partying. We're here. We know like a very small area, mm-hmm. yeah, sure. and then we're out. That's right. Maybe we'll yeah. come back. Maybe we won't. That's what's interesting. Like I get a focus group on this every single day because most of the people, well, ninety percent of the people that come in this dealership are eighteen to twenty-two. Yeah. They're these college kids that are going there that are the the talent that we're losing. Yeah. What I find is interesting is I've been here for sixteen years. And even whenever I first got here, I lived off campus, and I mean off off campus, and a lot of the apartment complexes where my friends lived, they lived in the Butler Plaza area. Now, the the places, the relics that, that we all remember whenever we were growing up here and everything, like they're, they're getting bulldozed for these monstrosity complexes to get built, and we're, we're going the opposite way, everything's narrowing. And it's creating what I feel and what I what I see whenever I talk to customers is more of a bubble where they don't set foot outside of campus. Right. So if the idea is to get people to embrace the things that make Gainesville unique, right. the nature, the parks, everything that, that's so amazing about our community, but we're closing this bubble to where people don't need to leave campus. They can walk across University Avenue and go to Target now. Right. Everything is right there. Mm-hmm. How, how are we helping that situation? Hold on, though. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's always, that was always mm-hmm. the conversation, though. They always oh. left, even without oh, man, the Target. Man. They always left when sure. it was the oh. old school Gainesville, you know, mom and pop place. They were still leaving. And now we're bringing these more, you know, commercialized mm-hmm. location. I mean, I drop. But you yeah, grew up here. I grew I, up here. My, my, my perspective is from somebody who came in. Right. Who didn't know Gainesville at all. Mm-hmm. And when I was here as a college student I only knew the college yes I only knew within a couple miles of the college and what all I'm saying is it's the same conversation yeah regardless of when you were here 20 years ago when it was you know old school Gainesville walking Mm -hmm. across the street at Target it was what was right there Burrito Brothers. Burrito, burrito Brothers. brothers. August Moon, right? Mount I mean, exactly. Mount Corey was a founder of that. What was the... Paul Corey was a founder of that. Yeah, Paul Corey was. And, you know, so it was, you know, one story. Now it's yeah. however right. many stories, It's but it's the same, same narrative. Yep. So it doesn't matter what they're looking at. It's the same narrative. And that's all I'm saying is that how do we get, even though it's a different view now, and right. it's a prettier view, Same. you could say, or an uglier view to you, maybe the way you explained it. Oh, it's not so cool. And, and you know, I, I've said it on the podcast a lot of times. I feel like sometimes like we, we look at the growth is great, great for the community. But I feel like what we risk is losing some of the, the vibe, the, the quirkiness course. that we've had in the city. But I don't think we've lost that vibe because you're going to find that vibe in other areas. That's what's great about Gainesville. We can change the view that we're seeing, but there's still that vibe in Gainesville. And that's what I love about Gainesville. You can go downtown, it's still downtown. 
I'm now Southwest girl with, you know, the kid. And I can go downtown and feel like it's the same downtown before. It's like dirty and, you know, you get really trashed. And it's the same, you know, mm. kind of bars that you were at before. And the same. Where do you get trashed at? <laughs> <laughs> we, well, we have lost the dive. Here tonight. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the dives and the venues, the concert venues and the dive bars and stuff like that. We have actually leveled some of those and and. But they're still out. out there. I mean, you don't think there's any dive bars anymore. We're losing them. Mm. Like 1982, the former Common Grounds, uh, the the cultural centers, all this stuff that was there. I mean, like we've got a couple. Uh, we were talking to who was it? Uh, Erica Alina's butt from from Backline about the the old venue um, for mm-hmm. the theater about needing that kind of space. But that they're we don't bringing it back. I mean, the owner now <laughs> is trying to bring that vibe back, and I mean, he's we been here for a long time, we need to. and yeah. he wants yeah. to bring it back. Well, my he question wants- is, why why did we lose? Why are we losing it? Why is it? Why is that happening? Specifically, that that venue or the no, no, just the vibe. Yeah, 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 I don't know. Um, Well, what what you're saying to us, these realtors here, all about (laughs) is that we're growing too much and too fast, and we're becoming this big city that has all these newer ideas, newer construction, more so, right? Newer businesses that are taking away the old school, divey type bars, Mm -hmm. but I still people are attracted to new. All right, I still see them out there. Mm-hmm. I still see that idea. No, 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 no. no they're, they're not. not. Right. They're attracted to cool. Okay. Yeah. So, and so, okay. and so, yeah. So, what happens is, you know, again, it's about identity. Okay. And so, mm-hmm. one thing I've been talking about, like at the chamber level, I'm like, you know, what is our identity? Like, who are we? If we define and promote who we are as a community, you know, we're not just we're not just University of Florida Gators and that kind of thing. That's that's a big part of who we are. It's not all of who we are. And so what our job is as a city is to define what we are, what's our draw, what, what, what is the thing about Gainesville that's going to attract people to come to us and want to be here forever, okay? And so This podcast, number one. All right, well, that's it. Well, there that's, are but that's cities that are bigger than that. us that still have the heart, mm-hmm. right? You go to Brooklyn, no there's dude. still a heart. Hello, Gainesville that's my hometown, still baby. Has a, yeah, well, that's why I said that. Gainesville <laughs> still has a heart. You just have to keep your heart, regardless of like the new construction that's like now, you know, 20 stories high versus the one story burrito brothers right or however you know tall that is you but you you have to keep the heart of it by bringing in people who have heart for it so that's why like the k museum that depot park i mean we're building the rose property off of you know northwest second ave in pleasant you know in the pleasant street area everybody's like oh no you're you're pushing out I don't want to push out, you know, anyone, the affordability, right? Mm-hmm. But that's that's like the cool, as, as Craig says. That's a cool place. But we're not taking the cool away. We're just making it new and bringing back a new cool. And right? We don't have to keep all the talent. We just want to, and we can't, but we want to keep more of it, right? right? That's going to take a partnership with the university. Um, I went to a small college, Stetson, small town. I think I had more kids in my class at GHS than at Stetson. And part of going to school there in the business schools, we actually went out and worked with local businesses as part of our class. We developed marketing plans, we toured their business, we learned about them and got involved with the community. We were able to work with a restaurant and that changed their name, changed their menu, changed the design of the restaurant and went from the brink of closing to opening a second location because they worked with bright, talented students. I slacked off maybe a little bit, but, <laughs> but if we can, you can't scale that to the number of students we have at UF, right? But if we can start really encouraging these talented students to work with local businesses through internships, through class projects, and get them exposed right. to the outside of that bubble of UF and see that there's some really great, interesting, exciting things going on here, some of them will stay. They will fall in love with this great town Absolutely. and stay. So it doesn't have to be all of them. We don't have to get every single student exposed to all of Gainesville, but if we can do more, that will have an impact on keeping more you know, of this town it's here. We- that's weird also, is that when there's something that we want to promote in Gainesville, we go to California to bring the promotion back here. Mm-hmm. Why don't we go to our Gainesville locals, whether they're local like I am, you know, or you are, Andy, ACR, or locals like you, Holly, who've been around since college, College or college students. Why do we got to go to California? No offense to California, Lisa, <laughs> but why do we have to go so far away to find talent when all the talent is here? Right. That is actually the biggest question. Why go away when there's so much? It, it might be young talent, but young talent's not bad talent. <coughs> young talent that is actually sometimes better so talent. So this is why I speak at the University of Florida so much. Mm-hmm. 
because so, I 100 percent believe in keeping our talent here. Mm-hmm. There's three main missions of this particular podcast, right? One is to keep our top seven talent here. Two is to attract experienced talent because that's the one thing that I hear about is that there's not enough experienced talent. There's not enough investor capital. So I'm trying to bring investor capital and experienced talent here. And then three is to build as many connections and collaborations within the community as possible. So that's the whole reason this podcast exists. Mm -hmm. I get the opportunity, I'm so blessed for the opportunity to go to the university and speak as much as I do on this particular subject. And I'm trying to make these students realize that, hey, you know, your top seven talent is needed. I understand that out of 60-ish thousand students that we're not gonna keep all of you, but if we can keep a larger percentage of you here, then that's great for Gainesville. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm blessed that I get the opportunity to do that as much as I do. and do it more, Colin. And yeah. with your do passion, you know, uh, really do like so much passion, because I mean, and, and everybody who's heard, who has heard my story, the first eighteen years has been traveling around the world. My dad was in the Air Force. My dad was I an Air Force fighter post. pilot. And that picture of you guys on the airplane is awesome. Yeah, dude, that's crazy, right? Love that it. That was so crazy. Selfish but first shirt. eighteen, first eighteen years, <laughs> all over the world. You know, I went to three high schools in four years. You know, that's where you got your people skills. You're welcome. Right, right. Absolutely. I credit that 100%. That, that's where that's I where learned how was. to build relationships. Mm-hmm. The character that I've developed in my entrepreneurial career has absolutely come from that because I had to learn how to make friends quick. There's no doubt about mm-hmm. it. Um, and I'm blessed with the opportunity to go to the University of Florida and talk to these students about, hey, you guys don't understand the opportunities that are here right here in Gainesville. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's 100% the reason for this podcast, right? So uh, I'm excited for what the future holds and I'm excited that we get to have conversations exactly like this. Let me me, me throw something in. I wanna follow up. Throw something in, Dave, let's go. I wanna follow up on what Andy said. So what Gainesville is missing, in my opinion, is the east side of Gainesville, you mentioned it. The east side of Gainesville, the income disparity in our community is huge. As a matter of fact, it's among the top 10 in the United States. And if I had a buck for every time a politician who ran for the city or county commission talked about fixing the east side, I'd have Craig Wilburn's money. <laughs> so so I will say what, what, what Gainesville is missing is not everybody is cut out for a college education. Not everybody's cut out for 10 years of college debt. Realtors what pe- what need people trades. need, people need jobs that actually allow them to try to help build and support families because not everybody's gonna be a college kid. And what Gainesville is missing is manufacturing. And we've been telling the East Side for years, the East Side should be angry at everybody because they've been, they've been made promises for 20, 30 years or more. Since I've been here in, in 87, people have been talking about how the, the East Side of Gainesville has a lot of potential and we haven't helped them at all. Everybody who's been elected since the day they got started till now has lied to the east side of Gainesville. We need to provide manufacturing jobs for the east side of Gainesville or just in Gainesville in general. We miss manufacturing. We've been a college. Everybody who's talked about Gainesville has talked about the students and college life. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is a college student in Gainesville. We've left a lot of people by the wayside. And in my opinion, Gainesville is a community that would benefit tremendously from having manufacturing. And we've been snooty. We, we like to think we're biotech. We talk, about, we talk about the hub. We talk about Sid Martin. We talk about a lot of things that are great for college kids. That doesn't help forklift drivers anywhere. We need manufacturing. And the fact is, you know, manufacturing leaves because we can't support the businesses that grow at the hub or at, for example, uh, San Velasco Tech City, right? One of his missions is to find a way to bridge the gap between the hub and the real world. And we need to be able to create a system where not only can you invent the most amazing technology in the world, you can build it here. You can provide jobs for people that aren't going to go to UF, provide jobs for people maybe graduate from Santa Fe or maybe graduate, don't graduate at all and can work and raise a family. And we're leaving them by the wayside. And I haven't looked at schedules recently, but the regional transit system does not help people who live on the east side who want to work at UF or Santa Fe. They don't start early enough for people to get to work on time. 
They don't end late enough for people to get off work and go home. And so the regional transit system, the public transportation, fails the people who need it the most. Mm. So where we lose, we lose out is we got politicians saying anything they can to get elected, and then they forget what they said, and they write out their terms and keep getting reelected on BS. And the east side is left behind. So in my opinion, where we lack is manufacturing jobs that support people on the east side, support people anywhere in the world that are not going to UF. I agree 100%. Like, I do too. One yes. of the, one of the cool like things about the Gainesville. Most important Just watch conversation. everybody step up to the mic oh, right dude. there. It's <laughs> the <laughs> most <laughs> important conversation. Whoa, well, let me, but let me get in on here. It's important not in Gainesville. It's important nationally. Yeah. You know, we're, we only support the higher education. Yeah. Not to say that that's bad, but we forget everyone else. And everyone. We talk about teamwork, right? Synergy and, and support and helping everyone. It's also bringing in the supporters and helping the supporters who support you to give them jobs and keep them out there. The same way that the successful investors incorporate real estate into their portfolio, the great cities for the most part have heavy industry and manufacturing somewhere Mm -hmm. around their city. It's an important part of the economy and we are way short on that here in Gainesville. Now check this out, okay? We don't value them. So in real estate, what is the most important aspect of value for any real estate property? Location. Location. Yeah. Okay. There it is. We say three. Location, location, location. 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 Good now, job, Lisa. take that, take that <laughs> truth <laughs> and apply it to the city of Gainesville. Yeah. Let's think about this That's now. True. Okay. Got, yeah, I got you. Talking about manufacturing. Gainesville. I can get from Gainesville. I can get to Tallahassee, Tampa, G- Georgia, mm-hmm. Orlando, Daytona Beach. You know. Within two hours, yeah. right? Jacksonville, location right? Phenomenal. This is a phenomenal. I'm four and a half hours to Miami, but we're and phenomenal. four and a half hours to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Not the way this I is, drive. This is a, this <laughs> is this, hours. this is a <laughs> tremendous opportunity for manufacturing. I, and I, I I can never figure out like why in the world do we not have a big like we should be shipping things from everywhere. You can drive within we two hours. Are. To all these major we cities. just don't notice that. Right. We actually are. That's why we can have high-end rentals because those people who are shipping, they're stopping here and, and renting $4,500 rentals. I'm so, mm-hmm. sorry, I had to like take over because they're in Miami and Atlanta and they're putting their people here, here. at $4,500 oh, rentals. This is, this is the hot spot this right is here. Money, right? This is it. Why are we taking spot. advantage of money? But we're all, you know, we also need to support the lower income, the affordable housing, so we can support those higher But end. manufacturing and heavy industry is dirty and blue collar and not maybe the most environmentally friendly. And we want high tech, clean, white collar, high paying jobs. We need to get over ourselves and bring in yeah. manufacturing. He said we're, we're too posh for ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> so what do we do? I mean, you said uh, all these politicians that run do so on empty promises they get in an office so it's not a matter of who the electorate elects so what, what do we do Wait, how do we so what we do is we get a little Dave more like flexible more hours yeah i'm sorry we get a little more flexible as zoning and land use we work into our comprehensive plan that we allow manufacturing on the east side in areas maybe where we weren't thinking about manufacturing you know um the reason that the it master plan through city politics I it has like, to happen through politics and it has to happen through politicians have to make a decision you know what we've had enough we need to provide jobs um, we put Dave on the city commission is what we do. Right. I mean, is, is that what it takes? I'm not eligible. I live in Alachua. Yeah. Oh. County commission. March 17th, you can vote for city. Yeah. 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 I think that's right. Only 4% of, of Gainesville votes because they don't care. Because, again, students. <laughs> but only 4% people vote. But you can vote. But, but what does it take for the person to actually do it? Because what, what we're hearing, though, is it's not a matter of who you're electing because they're saying they're going to do the right, right things and then they don't do them. So here's the deal. Retail jobs sound great. Retail jobs pay minimum wage. So you're not gonna get retailers in an area where the demographics don't support retail. You gotta get manufacturing in an area because manufacturers, manufacturing is more not so much about the location, it's more about delivering services, convenience to the I-75 or the interstates, right? Mm-hmm. You've gotta have, you got to have manufacturers close by to the interstate who provide services and jobs. And when you have manufacturers providing jobs, you're raising the income level of people around the manufacturing because they have jobs there that are dependable. And when they do that, retailer, retailers are gonna look at that and say, oh, those people that make more money now. I wanna be there, right? The first the first business to drop, pop up anywhere is a dollar store. Because dollar stores don't care how much people make around them because they can they can be there, right? They, they support the demographic no matter what. Retail is not gonna go somewhere unless there's enough jobs and, and money to support them. We beat out Tallahassee with a cheesecake factory, right? How excited do you think that people are on the east side of Gainesville that there's a cheesecake factory? Have you looked at their menu? I mean, I, mean, I love them, I love them dearly, but I gotta have a job to eat there, right? Right. 
and not a job at a dollar store. So retail's good, but that's not a job provider. We need manufacturing jobs with benefits that people can raise a family on so they can go out and take their family out to eat on a Friday or Saturday. The, where, where the politicians have failed is they've been snooty. They want biotech. They want stuff that's cool that they can brag to San Antonio and Houston that they got when in fact it doesn't really matter. It doesn't raise the, the standard of living for people who don't make as much money. We need jobs that mean something. Forklift drivers, you know, a buddy of mine can take a kid out of high school, put him through a program and get him to be a plumber making $60,000 a year in five years. How many college kids would like to graduate high school and make 60 grand a year in five years? The promise of college is great, but you know what, the the odds of making 60 grand when you graduate college in five years or whatever it is, pretty low. Right. And these people have no college debt. So I love UF and I'm a graduate three times, right? But for us to support the east side of Gainesville, we gotta provide jobs that mean something. And right now we're not. I think what it's gonna take is somebody's gonna have to sell the company that's going to bring that business here on the promise of Gainesville and the people who live here are going to have to demand of our leaders and politicians that we make it work for that business to come open up shop, whether it's an Amazon distribution center or a factory that makes some product that we tell our leaders, we want this and you need to make it work, whatever it takes, because we need the jobs over there. And and those jobs will bring the retail and and the fast food and the things that the people live there want which will just create more jobs. But somebody's gonna have to sell a large company on the opportunity here and, and we are all gonna have to convince our leadership that we need them to make that happen and we're not gonna vote for them again if they don't. I think that's one of the, at least my, my missions of this podcast is getting people on that page so that we know what that path forward is because I think people have different ideas, whether it's university, Santa Fe, businesses, entrepreneurs, like it's, we all have these ideas, but how do we, how do we focus that forward and, and take the steps necessary to make that happen? I mean, I think we, we agree what the end result needs to be, but it's how do we get there? Yeah. Right. Right. And if we knew, we'd all have Craig Wilburn money. <laughs> Amen. We all Craig right, so Wilburn's money. <laughs> I got five because I'm broke. <laughs> yeah, so we we need to wrap this up. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. this has been a ton of fun, but let's go around the room. Let our, let our audience know where they can get they can connect with you. Oh, okay. All right. And I'm going to go to the bathroom while you do this. Uh, <laughs> oh, is, that, is that why you do that? Yeah, so you're good. So you just go around and like talk. All right, so Craig Wilburn, Team Dynamo, Keller Williams, uh, Gainesville Realty Partners. And um, the best way to connect with me would be our, our number, our office number, 352-363-1830, 363-1830. Or email at um, well, let's see. I got a ton of email addresses. How about how about we? <laughs> the easiest uh, one to spell because yeah, you probably want to do that. How about soul? How about s o l d at t dynamo dot com? S o l d at the letter t is in Tom, d is in David, y n is in Nancy, a m o m is in Mary o dot com. T dynamo dot com. Just slow Best down. Best way to uh, to find us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, indeed. For those watching the video, we'll, we'll, fl- we'll flash those up. Good, if you're good, listening, good. you'll have to pay pay attention to the spellings there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My name is Holly Mobis, and I work for Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. I think the best way to contact me would be to email me at holly at Thomas Group Realty. That's H-O-L-L-Y at Thomas Group Realty. Or you can reach, uh, reach me on Facebook at facebook.com. Uh, Holly Mobis Realtor or Instagram Holly Mobis. Um, I could give my cell, but I don't know if I should. No, you should. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. But message Ow. me. Call, girl. Call me. All right, Andy Malden at Pepin Realty. If you want to reach me, uh, at Andy Malden Realtor on Instagram. If you DM me, that will get definitely get through the clutter. Uh, it's A N D Y M A U L D I N Realtor. Um, and my cell phone number is 352-262-1047. You can call me or text me there, and uh, I know how to block a contact, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> I, I heard we can text you at 2 a.m., is that correct? <laughs> It'll be on silent mode, so go ahead. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I am Kristen Rebel at Rebel Realty Group, but everything you can... Uh, reach me on is buysellrebel.com so B-U-I as in buy a house S-E-L-L as in sell a house R-A-B-E-L-L dot com so info at buysellrebel.com or just buysellrebel.com or 
Buy, Sell, Rebel on Facebook, Buy, Buy, Sell, Rebel on Instagram, on anything you want to go on, Google. What's your TikTok? YouTube. TikTok. <laughs> TikTok. Let's, yeah. let's buy, go. Sell, rebel. The rebellion. The rebellion. Come on. Oh, that's Let's good. Go. Oh, he's no, that's good. No, 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 we already did that. that. I did that. Uh-huh. I copied from her. Time. That was my. <laughs> that, that's now he's deal. like nine, Sorry. but that was my six year old. That's good. Yeah, like the re- the join the rebellion. The rebel the revolution. Yeah. The revolution. Yeah. yeah. So mine is simple. Just Google me. I'll spell my last name for you. It's F is in Frank. E R R O. If you if you Google Dave Farrow. You'll find me. You'll find my yes. website. You'll find my phone number and everything. So, F E R R O. Yeah, boy. Let's go. <laughs> All right. I'm Lisa Fetro. That's F is in Frank, E T R O W. I'm with I'm Caldwell Banker. Too. And um, you can give me a call at 352 519 1242. Um, you can find me anywhere if you just Google lisafetro.com or you go on Facebook or Instagram. I'm known as Realtor Mom Lisa Fetro. I would love to hear from you. Or just come visit me for a class at the gym sometime. Yeah. I'm there too. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, 9.30. Easy. Her classes are super easy. <laughs> this is Dave again. She scares me. They call it Excite Bike. Super easy with the nose. So what, what gym is this? Uh, Gainesville Health and Fitness. Okay. Okay. Local just business. Just get that plug Yeah. Too. Yeah. Nice. GHFC, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, Joe, in the house. <laughs> you guys, I want to say thank you so much for coming and joining us for episode 100 and for participating in our first mastermind session this was super interesting and i'm just grateful that all of you guys were here and um had fun it was good. Hey, Gainesville, everybody who's listening, thank you so much for listening. Please support our podcast. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you are listening. Leave us a review. We appreciate your support so much. And uh, this is the WHOA GNV podcast, the podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. <laughs> we will see you later. You Bye. Alright, four people I already love, two people I love now. This is awesome. Yeah. 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 Great.